Good evening. Welcome. Thanks for being here on this extraordinary occasion. I'm Deborah Landau, director of NYU's Creative Writing Program. We've gathered tonight to celebrate and pay tribute to the magnificent life and work of the great American poet, Gawi Cannell. I'd like to thank the writers, friends, and family members who've made the effort to be here tonight to read a poem and share a memory. I'd like to thank our partners, the Academy of American Poets, Cave Canem, Poets House, the, Poets, the Poetry Society of America, the 92nd Street Y. Warmest gratitude to Bobby Bristol for her vision and support, and special thanks to Laura Sillerman and to Cooper Union for donating this beautiful and historic space. You'll hear a lot tonight about Galway's brilliant work as a poet, and I'd like to take just a moment to note that in addition to his legendary gifts as a writer, Galway was also an exceptionally gifted and generous teacher and mentor, and a visionary co-founder and founding director of the NYU Creative Writing Program. My predecessor, Melissa Hammerly, noted in a recent email exchange Galway's deep commitment to serving the larger literary community as a poet statesman, as a mentor, and as the guiding spirit of the NYU writing program. As a senior poet, he recognized his responsibility to cultivate the creative lives of younger poets. Galway's ideals and vision continue to inform the very fabric of the NYU community, just as his creative spirit and enduring work have shaped the life of each of the organizations represented here tonight. Each of the speakers will say a few words and read a favorite poem, and they're going to read in the order in which they appear on your program. The first speaker is Toy Derricott. Please welcome her. What an audience. I, I have the feeling that a lot of people here love and are grateful to Galway in the same way I am. So it's wonderful to celebrate with you and feel so much a part of this community. So mostly I want to talk about how I love, loved and love Galway and talk about what he did for me. He, he wasn't a best friend, but he was the great poetry teacher of my life. And what I mean by that is there are certain people that I chose to watch, and I would just watch what they did. And I would watch his poetry, but I would also watch the way he lived his life, and as he got older, and even as he died. And I learned how to be a poet by watching him. Sometimes I would watch him literally, like I remember at NYU, it, sometimes when somebody would read a poem, he would be very quiet. He wouldn't say much. And I figured he was just being nice, you know, to us. <laughs> and, but I would always watch his right eyebrow, which <laughs> it seemed to leap. And I would just, I could think he, he could hardly contain himself, you know, from leaping across the table. But um, he was the first person at NYU that I told that I'm black. And I, I told him how uncomfortable I was being the only one in every class and how uncomfortable it was to write about it. And he said, what can I do to help? And I learned a lot about being a poet and, and loving people. So um, 20 years ago, Kavi Kanem came into being and um, the Foundation for African American Poets, and he has been one of our principal supporters from the beginning. So I wrote a little poem about mortality, which is one of his subjects, and uh, how the things that we value stay with us. Uh, you'll notice that I'm stealing a few words from his poems. I may forget where Verona, PA is, 
and my sweetheart may have to remind me it's the town we pass through each time we drive to his house. And I may forget the name of that Thai restaurant we head for, but I remember that poem of Galway's, almost word for word, about the springs the stubbornness has been loved out of. And as each word uncurls, I remember the tail, T-A-I-L, of the sow touched back to loveliness. And I may forget who you are, who I am. Already the black holes are impregnating my brain with dark stars. But I know a great poet still passes there who makes and remakes these singing words. And um, I'm going to read from the avenue bearing the initial of Christ into the new world. Uh, there's 14 sections. I'm going to read section six. Starts with an epigraph. This may be Galway's words because it's, there's not, it's not attributed. Was diese kleine Gasse doch für ein Reich an sich war. What was this little alley but an empire in itself? In the pushcart market on Sunday, a crate of lemons discharges light like a battery. Icicle-shaped carrots that through black soil wove away lie like flames in the sun. Onions with their shirt ripped seek sunlight on green skins. The sun beats on beets dirty as boulders in cow fields. On turnips pinched and gibbous from bud budging rocks, on embery sweets, on Idaho's, Long Islands, and Maine's, on horseradishes still growing weeds on the flat ends, on cabbages lying about like sea green brains the skulls have been shucked from, on tomatoes, undented plum tomatoes, alligator skinned cucumbers that float pickled in the wooden tubs of green skim milk. Sky flowers, dirt flowers, under dirt flowers, those that climbed for the sun in their lives and those that wormed away, equally uprooted, maimed, lopped, shucked, and misaimed. In the market in Damascus, a goat came to a stall where 12 goat heads were lined up for sale. It sniffed them one by one. Finally, 13 goats started smiling in their faintly sardonic way. A crone buys a pickle from a crone. It is wrapped in the mirror. At home, she will open the wrapping stained and stare and stare and stare at it and the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. I want to tell you two brief stories about Galway. When I was 17 and a freshman at the University of Arizona, I used to go and sit in the shade of an old gnarled olive tree in front of the cottage where the visiting poets would stay. I was far too shy to actually talk to any of them. But from that vantage point, I saw Phil Levine and Mark Strand, Jim Tate and William Stafford, Allen Ginsberg, and of course Galway, emerge from the cottage door and walk in the brilliant sunlight each of them seeming to me, in fact, to walk not quite touching the ground. Galway's reading, the first of his I'd ever heard, was either just before or shortly after the publication of the Book of Nightmares. He read The Hen Flower and Under the Maud Moon, which had me floating above myself in the dark air of the auditorium for a while. And what else, I don't know, something became utterly clear to me that night, though I couldn't have said then what it was. Of any poet I'd heard, of the makers who'd shaped my generation's sense of what poetry could do, here the stakes were the highest. 
He would name the ways the soul is educated by love, grief, and time. The pilgrim drove his own quest forward and held his poems to an extraordinarily demanding standard. In their making, the poet himself would change. In hearing those stanzas spoken aloud, so would the listener. Flash forward a good 40 years, and my partner Alexander and I, along with our friends Catherine and Eric, are at Bobby and Galway's farmhouse. It's a late fall afternoon, just beginning to shade toward twilight, and Galway announces it's time for croquet. <laughs> Wickets are set up on a big rough square of grass beyond which our collective dogs are digging and leaping in quest of voles. The game begins, and we aren't very far into it when Galway makes a somewhat arcane pronouncement about a rule which has just been broken. Something to do with touching two wickets with your ball and thus losing a turn? In a short while, there is another such occurrence, a rule violated that none of us knew. And then, in a bit, a third such transgression. <laughs> At first, I think, probably we all think, that Galway's knowledge of croquet is indeed encyclopedic. <laughs> and then, as the wind comes up and it's growing colder and darker, so that it's hard to see just where that last tunnel of wickets you're aiming for is, I realize that Galway is, in all likelihood, inventing the rules. And as darkness falls, he announces quite happily that he has won. <laughs> I can truly say that all of us there are delighted that he has. Now, this second tale is a crucial corollary to the first. Galway's early work, intensely spiritual, urgent, pressurized by the will to see into the nature of things, is magnificent. And it also represents a standard to which no human poet can hold himself. Orpheus, maybe. But for the rest of us, that pressure can become overly limiting, excluding too much of life. And therefore, Galway had the good sense, the genius, to do things differently. His late work is wonderfully funny, formally inventive, and wild in its thinking. I read the poems of the last 15 years or so, and, when, and often I don't know where we're going. And then suddenly they arrive at a kind of presence, an accumulation of humor, an anecdote, question, and intuition, and loopy idea. And here, miraculously, is some sort of poem we've never seen before. I'm going to read you one of those, a poem made entirely of questions, and I have never read anything like it. I suspect it teaches us how to be a spirit and a body, how to be profound and ordinary, idiosyncratic, and for a poet, it teaches this. You can go to the mountaintop for a vision, and you can come back to the mud and tenderness of the daily world, and one may be as good and as rich as the other. Why regret? Didn't you like the way the ants helped the peony globes open by eating the glue off? Weren't you cheered to see the iron workers sitting on an I-beam dangling from a cable in a row like starlings, eating lunch, maybe bologna on white with fluorescent mustard? Wasn't it a revelation to waggle from the estuary all the way up the river, the kill, the pearl, the run, the rent, the beck, the psych barely trickling to the shock of a spring? Didn't you almost shiver? hearing book lice clicking their sexual dissonance inside an old Webster's New International, perhaps just having eaten out of it Izzel, Zeister, and Thalassicon. What did you imagine lies in wait anyway at the end of a world whose subsubstance is gleam, gleet, bird lime, slime, mucus, muck? Forget about becoming emaciated. Think of the wren and how little flesh is needed to make a song. Didn't it seem somehow familiar when the nymph split open and the mayfly struggled free and flew and perched and then its own backs broke open and the imago, the true adult, somersaulted out and took flight, seeking the swarm, mouth parts vestigial, elementary canal come to a stop, a day or an hour left to find the desired one. Or when Casanova took up the platter of Linguini and squid's ink and slid the stuff out the window saying, as telling his startled companion, the perfected lover does not eat. As a child, didn't you find it calming to imagine pinworms as some kind of tiny batons giving cadence to the squeezes and releases around the downward march of debris? Didn't you glimpse in the monarchs what seemed your own inner blazonry flapping and gliding in desire in the middle air? Weren't you reassured to think those flimsy, hinged beings and then their offspring and then their offspring's offspring could navigate, working in shifts, all the way to Mexico, to the exact plot, perhaps the very tree, by tracing the flare of the bodies of ancestors who fell in the same migration a year ago. Doesn't it outdo the pleasures of the brilliant concert to wake in the night and find ourselves holding hands in our sleep?
Hello. I uh, teach in the NYU program that Galway Cannell helped to create. And the day that he died, I told my students that writing is really the worst way to spend a life unless you can believe that your call will not merely echo, but be answered. A little more than a year ago, someone was on the way to my house to meet after the exchange of a series of increasingly long and intimate letters. She texted that she was 10 minutes away, and I responded, have you ever read the poet Galway Cannell? I recently spent an afternoon with him in Vermont, and I'm thinking about one of his poems now, the call across the valley of not knowing. I'd merely meant to plant a seed, but I accidentally struck oil, because as it turned out, Cannell had been her favorite writer since she was a teenager. She'd read the book of nightmares until the pages fell from it. Half a year after that, it was the woman's birthday. I wrote to Galway's wife, Bobby. Bobby is here. Bobby is there. It's so nice to see you. Um, I wrote to Galway's wife, Bobby, sharing the story of that text and all that followed. And I asked if maybe Galway could sign a book to her or if there might be a piece of paper he'd written on or some old glasses or other artifact that I might be able to give as a gift. Remarkably, Bobby remembered a fan letter that the woman had sent as a girl and suggested that we give, and it was now a mutual gift, one of Galway's typewriters. Obviously, he can't use this or any typewriter anymore, she wrote. He won't even be able to sign a card. Wanting to spare Bobby the trouble of having to pack it up and schlep it to a post office, I found someone on Craigslist who agreed to pick the typewriter up and drive it through the night to me. I got a call just before the messenger left. My boyfriend and I are ready to go, but you know, given that we're taking this package across state lines, we kind of have to ask <laughs> if it's drugs. <laughs> I told her it was the typewriter of a great poet. After a moment, she said, I actually believe you. When they arrived six hours later, the three of us drank coffee and shared some stories. She and her boyfriend held hands the whole time. Three months later, Galway Cannell died, and I told my class that writing is the worst of all ways to spend a life, unless you can maintain belief in the return call. It wasn't at all clear to me how much Galway understood that afternoon I spent with him at his home in Vermont. At one point while eating lunch, he put his enormous hand probably the biggest hand I've ever seen in my life, on Bobby's face as if to conceal the near future from her. Behind him, in a lumpy plastic bag hung on the kitchen's doorknob was a small placard that read, Socks in Search of Partners. <laughs> in a short letter that accompanied the package, Bobby wrote, this typewriter is very old with white out streaks on the roller, which is proof of process. And sometimes I think about the white lines of the road that are being pulled beneath the car, bringing the typewriter from Vermont, and that young couple, and how one has to believe it's not an echo you're hearing, because there's no proof of it being a returned call. But Bobby was right, there is proof, proof of process. So I thought I would read the end of that poem, The Call Across the Valley of Not Knowing. It's a rather long poem, I'll just read the end. We who live out our plain lives, who put our hand into the hand of whatever we love as it vanishes, as we vanish and stumble toward what will be simply by arriving, a kind of fate, some field, maybe a flaked stone scattered in the starlight, where the flesh swaddles its skeleton a last time before the bones go their way without us. Might we not hear, even then, the bare call from the hillside, a call like ours needing to be answered, and the damn bare call across the darkness of the valley of not knowing, 
the only word, tongue shape without intercession. Yes, yes. Thank you. Well, I loved Galway, loved Galway, and intend to whatever the future will of Galway. I met him in uh, 1973. I think it was the first time I was invited to give a poetry reading anywhere. And he was also giving a poetry reading on the same occasion. And to make a point, um, at some point in the q and I recited one of his poems from memory, and he's kind of liked me ever since. I was thinking about what to read, and I was thinking about the two great uh, poet loves of Galway's life, or two of the four or five, were Whitman for what's in Galway's poetry that is a, a, an absolute desire to live a physical life in the body and to look at the world and its beauty and ugliness and see it and honor it. And the other is, is the Rilkean side of his work, which was to somehow he thought the imagination had to um, uh, contr wrestle a, a blessing from mortality. And he worked those two things out, I think, and first in the, in the avenue bearing the initial of Christ in the New World for the Whitman side, and then in the Book of Nightmares for the, for the um, um, Rilkean side of his work. And the passion with which he went about the act of poetry was a model to me almost every day of my life after that time of first meeting him. And I just want to say, we, when you go home, Look at the Book of Nightmares again. Look at that extraordinary work that he did. I wanted to do poems about um, the small things that he, that he does. Um, he's really great at looking at animals. Um, and, um, and, he, one, and a lot of people wrote poems about what animals were feeling. And Galway wrote great poems. I think maybe some of the great nature poems of our time in English. Uh, about not knowing what animals <laughs> are thinking, and so I want to. I'm going to read two. So I want to read one poem about his passionate relation to creature life, and one poem about his passionate relation to our kind of life, which is to say, language life. So the gray heron, Galway canal. It held its head still, while its body and green legs wobbled in wide arcs from side to side. When it stalked out of sight, I went after it, but all I could find where I was expecting to find the bird was a three-foot-long lizard in ill-fitting skin and with linear mouth expressive of the even temper of the mineral kingdom. It stopped and tilted its head, which was much like a field stone with an eye in it, which was watching me to see if I would go or change into something else. It's just an amazing leap into the, into what, who knows what the hell lizards think about <laughs> cause and effect. He understood that cause and effect was really a kind of tangential operation of our way of seeing the world. And Blackberry Eating is a poem in which he celebrates that. So the other thing about Galway uh, is the humor in his, in his poetry, the affection and humor in it. And, and the sense of uh, that poetry and love are at the center of life. Blackberry eating. I have to go out, I love to go out in late September among the fat, overripe, icy black blackberries to eat blackberries for breakfast. The stalks very prickly, a penalty they earn for knowing the black art of blackberry making. And as I stand among them, lifting the stalks to my mouth, the ripest berries fall almost unbidden to my tongue, as words sometimes do. Certain peculiar words like strengths and squinched, many-lettered, one-syllable lumps, which I squeeze 
squinch open and splurge well in the silent, startled, icy black, blackberry language of blackberry eating in late September. Thank you very much. I met Galway in 1982. I just published a book I'd been reading in my whole life. I was just in awe to meet him, and I was his assistant at Breadloaf. I didn't really talk to him much, but every day he'd come into class and say, Eddie and I were thinking about what we should do today, <laughs> and we decided this is what we should do. It, I, I felt so great about it, even though I, I really didn't have anything to say. Every day I came in and he'd say, this is what Eddie and I decided to do. I felt great, and so after, I guess it was eight days, we came in, and before he could say anything, I said, Galway and I decided that today we should write a poem of praise. And he goes, you know, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> um, like almost everyone on this stage, we were formed by reading him. I mean, I was in my 30s, he was in his 50s, so when I was in my 20s, in his 40s, and uh, I just can't tell you how formative it was to read those books, poem by poem and book by book. And uh, Bob mentioned the two dimensions, the two, two sides of his work, the Rilkean side and the Whitman-esque side. One of the things I want to say about the Whitman-esque side was how rare it was in American poetry. Um, just remember that the, the, the great edifice of modernism um, was American modernism, especially through Pound and Eliot, was really a poetry of despair, and it was really a po poetry of a sense of a botched civilization, of a wrecked world. And they were um, somewhat contemptuous of Walt Whitman. And Galway belonged to a generation, and he wasn't the only one, but he had an absolutely different approach. And it was a radical approach in the 20th century to try and write a poetry of praise, to try and write a poetry of celebration, and to do that through free verse. And his models there were Christopher Smart and Walt Whitman. And behind it was the idea that despite the despair, despite the sorrow, despite the grief, despite the social injustice, we should try to praise the natural world and try to live in our bodies in that world. It was really a very radical thing to do because for modernists, anything like free verse that was of the kind that he wanted to write with such a democratic ethos was considered sentimental. But he decided to inhabit the body and to write a poetry of great passion. And it reminded us that American poetry could be a poetry of joy. It didn't have to only be a poetry of sorrow. I've always really treasured that side of his work. And I want to re read you a great poem of sacramentalization, and it's called St. Francis and the Sow, which clarified for me the secular religious nature of his work. The other thing about his free verse is it's so natural seeming that you can miss how skillful it is. And the test of his, the test of his sincerity is how, how naturally it's done. So this poem um, is all one sentence. St. Francis in the Sow. The bud stands for all things, even for those things that don't flower for everything flowers from within of self-blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch, it is lovely until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. As St. Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her in words and in touch blessings of earth on the sow, and the sow began remembering all down her thick length, from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail. From the hard spine in a spiked out from the spine down through the great broken heart to the sheer blue milk and dreaminess spurting and shuddering from the 14 tits into the 14 mouths sucking and blowing beneath them the long, perfect loveliness of sow. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. If St. Francis had been sexy, he would have been Galway Canal. <laughs> <clears throat> the loveliness of Sal. Um, I'm falling through time here, sitting and listening to some of the stories. Um, when I first came to New York, where are you, uh, Bobby? There you are. Um, I was a friend of Stanley Kunitz's, and Stanley and Galway were very close. Um, and I was invited with Stanley over to Bobby and Galway's one night for a dinner. One of the things Galway did was he created communities. He gathered poets together so we could all talk to each other. I remember the first night I went over there, I couldn't even believe I was walking over to Galway Canal's apartment. <laughs> um, and, and then I was asked back again and again, and one of the things Galway did was he would ask questions of everybody at the table, and then he would ask a question about your answer. And then he would ask a question about that answer. It's a rare thing, you know, to have that kind of curiosity. But I was thinking of Charlie Williams and how he wanted to be here tonight. And one night when I was there, there were all these, I think of these guys as the kings, you know, Galway, um, Charlie Williams, William Matthews, Robert Bly might have been there. Um, they were all contemporaries. And so I said to them, how did you guys, how did you guys meet? And Charlie Williams told the most amazing story. I teach at Sarah Lawrence, and he said, well, we had just read this book, um, Bill Matthews and I, by this poet named Galway Cannell. And we heard he was going to read it, Sarah Lawrence. So we took the train up there. This was so strange to be listening to the story 40 years later when I was teaching at Sarah Lawrence. It was a winter night. They arrived. They sat with the crowd waiting for this Galway Cannell to arrive. And they heard... Um, Someone came in and said, what was it, Bobby? His car broke down or something. It was snowy. Something had happened. And um, he would be a while, but he was going to make it. So everybody waited and waited and waited. Um, but it was a snowy night, and it was cozy in the room, and they waited and waited. After about an hour and a half, the door banged open, and in walked this man. And... Charlie Williams looked across the table into Galway's face and said, and in walked the most handsome man I've ever seen. <laughs> and, um, and then they heard him read. And to hear them talk about going to hear Galway, you know, and to hear him for the first time and meet him for the first time was extremely moving to me. NYU has that flavor as well. I joke around and say it's the lovey-dovey program, um, but it really is. What Sharon and Galway have made is they've made a writing program that is not competitive but rigorous, um, a program that's truly loving, generous, supportive, unlike any other program I've ever been a part of. I'm going to say a poem that many of us, I'm sure, say to ourselves often. I probably say it to myself several times a week. It's the poem on one of the cards you might have gotten coming in. It's called Prayer. Whatever happens, whatever what is, is, is what I want. Only that, but that. Whatever happens, whatever what is, is, is what I want. Only that, but that. A short story or whatever. So now I'm going to read uh, two more poems. One by me and another by uh, Yates again. The one by me is a fragment, uh, a part of a, a longer poem, uh, and has to do with the 
birth, not of Maud this time, but of uh, Fergus. And it goes like this. A black bear sits alone in the twilight, nodding from side to side, turning slowly around and around on himself, scuffing the four-footed circle into the earth. He sniffs the sweat in the breeze. He understands a creature, a death creature, watches from the fringe of the trees. Finally, he understands, I am no longer here. He himself, from the fringe of the trees, watches a black bear get up, eat a few flowers, trudge away, all his fur glistening in the rain. And what glistening? Sancho Fergus, my boy child, had such wide shoulders. When he was born, his head came out. The rest of him stuck. And he opened his eyes, his head out there, all alone in the room. He squinted with pained, barely unglued eyes at the ninth month's blood splashing beneath him on the floor and almost smiled, I thought, almost forgave it all in advance. And when he came wholly forth, I took him up in my hands and bent over and smelled the black glistening fur of his head, as empty space must have bent over the newborn planet and smelled the grasslands and the fern. Hi, I'm Major Jackson. My first time uh, talking to Galway Connell was um, August of 1997. And I had been hired to book a reading in which he was to feature um, in Portland, Oregon. And um, I can't believe the, my boss gave me his number and said, call him. And um, I pushed it back and said, you call him. <laughs> um, I'll probably bumble through, but I did call him, had a terrific conversation. We, we, uh, we uh, talked about uh, Vermont and the weather there. And it was time for me to ask him for his address to send him the contract. And he said, Galway Canal, Sheffield, Vermont, zero five four something and I said that's it <laughs> he said Galway Canal <laughs> Sheffield Vermont zero five seven. I thought wow he's so big he has his own town <laughs> or Sheffield is so small <laughs> having lived in now living in Vermont I know that um uh, he's both uh, big and he is an inextricable part of that community in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, I also um, want to say that it's hard not to read deeply into American poetry and not encounter Galway Cannell. Um, he's someone, when I was in graduate school, you read all of his work, you read his interviews, you found audio, you found um, uh, videos of him. And one of those videos that I found was uh, an excerpt of him talking in that series, uh, Voices and Visions. And he is talking about Whitman. That's the kind of subtext here. And in that, um, in that video, he makes this fantastic observation and statement that has been one of the kind of guiding thoughts that uh, rings in my mind when I am writing. Um, he said, most poets, when they talk about poets, they talk about how they have a great ear. Um, but Whitman had a great mouth. And if you 
ever heard Galway read, you know that um, just as important to him as what he was uttering was the elements of what he was uttering, the words themselves. Um, that is a lesson for all of us who uh, are students of the art. Um, and those of, those of us who are current students, I would say, um, he's one poet that you should go to and he'll lead you back to other poets um, like Whitman. Um, I met him maybe on uh, maybe f uh, half a dozen times and every time he was sharply dressed. And I'm gonna say that because no one's ever gonna say that. He was a snazzy dresser. <laughs> I've decided to read his poem, uh, The Perch. Um, this is a poem like many of his poems that was said earlier that kind of marries the natural world with um, uh, the sensuousness of the, of the natural world with the sensuous of the human body, the human and human experience and celebrates that in, um, in when I say romantic, I don't mean in a love, in a love kind of way, but in the um, British romantic sense that the natural world is indeed the space in which we kind of find evidence of, of ourselves. The perch. There is a fork in a branch of an ancient, enormous maple, one of a grove of such trees where I climb sometimes and sit and look out over miles of valleys and low hills. Today on skis, I took a friend to show her the trees. We set out down the road, turned in at the lane which a few weeks ago when the trees were almost empty and the November snows had not yet come, lay thickly covered in bright red and yellow leaves. Crossed the swamp, passed the cellar hole, holding the remains of the 1850s farmhouse that had slid down into it by stages in the 30s and 40s. Followed the overgreen logging road and came to the trees. I climbed up to the perch and this time looked not into the distance, but at the tree itself, its trunk contorted by the terrible struggle of that time when it had its hard time. After the trauma, it grows less solid. It may be some such time now comes upon me. It would have to do with the unaccomplished and with the attempted marriage of solitude and happiness. Then a rifle sounded several times, quite loud from across the valley, percussions of the custom of male mastery over the earth the most grateful, most alert of the animals being chosen to die. I looked to see if my friend had heard, but she was stepping about on her skis, studying the trees, smiling to herself, her lips still filled for all we had drained them with hundreds and thousands of kisses. Just then she looked up, the way from low to high the God blesses, and the blue of her eyes shone out of the black and white of bark and snow as lovers who are walking on a freezing day touch icy cheek to icy cheek, kiss, then shudder to discover the heat waiting inside their mouths. I have a photograph of Galway uh, with his arm around Everest Knight on my desk. And I realize that he is still instructive to me. And it has everything to do with the sounds within the context of language. Galway was also an activist, but he didn't really talk about that moment 
of active, where he was so active in the South. And um, I'm going to read a poem that I wrote for him years ago. It's called Praise Be. When the trees were guilty, hugged up to history, and locked in a cross brace with Whitman's Louisiana live oak, you went into that mossy weather. Did you witness the shotguns at Angola riding on horseback through the tall sway of sugar cane, the glint of blue steel in the blood red strawberry fields? Silence was backed up in the cypress, but you could hear the birds of woe singing praise where the almost broken through sorrow rose from the deep woods and walked out into moonshine as the brave ones. You went among those who had half a voice, whose ancestors mastered quicksand by disappearing. Maybe our paths cross, ghosts hog-tied in the wounded night. But it is only now I say this, go away. Thanks for going down into our fierce hush at the crossroads to look fear in the eye. Go away. Galway was very brave. He was brave in the subjects that he had to write through and also the borders he crossed. His immense capacity for friendship that broke many locks. The poem I'm going to read of his is entitled, The Man Split in Wood in the Daybreak. The man split in wood in the daybreak looks strong, as though if one weakened, one could turn to him and he would help. Gus Newland was strong. When he split wood, he struck hard flashing the bright steel through air of daybreak so fast rock maple leapt apart. As they think marriages will in countries about to institute divorce. And even willow, which though stacked to dry a full year on separating actually weeps totem wood, therefore, to the merit until death, sniffled as Sandra, but Gus is dead. We could turn to our fathers but they protect us only through the harsh grace of the numerous cut into their headstones. Or to other mothers whose love so devastated can't even in spring break through the hard earth. Our spouses weaken at the same rate we do. We have to hold our children up to lean on them. Everyone who could help 
goes or hasn't arrived? What about the man split in wood in the daybreak who looked strong? That was years ago. I myself was that man split in wood in the daybreak. Sleeps head sprouting hair in the moonlight. You cry, waking from a nightmare. When I sleepwalk into your room and pick you up and hold you up in the moonlight, you cling to me hard, as if clinging could save us. I think you think I will never die. I think I exude to you the permanence of smoke or stars, even as my broken arms heal themselves around you. I have heard you tell the sun, don't go down. I have stood by as you have told the flower, don't grow old, don't die, little Maud. I would blow the flame out of your silver cup. I would suck the rot from your fingernail. I would brush your sprouting hair of the dying light. I would scrape the rust off your ivory bones. I would help death escape through the little ribs of your body. I would alchemize the ashes of your cradle back into wood. I would let nothing of you go, ever until washerwomen feel clothes fall asleep in their hands, and hens scratch their spell across hatchet blades, and rats walk away from the cultures of the plague, and iron twists weapons towards the true north, and grease refuses to slide in the machinery of progress, and men feel as free on earth as fleas on the bodies of men, and the widow still whispers back and forth with the presence no longer beside her in the dark. And yet, perhaps, this is the reason you cry, this the nightmare you wake crying from, being forever in the pre-trembling of a house that falls. In a restaurant once, everyone quietly eating, you clambered up on my lap to all the mouthfuls rising toward all the mouths. At the top of your voice, you cried your one word, caca, caca, caca. And each spoonful stopped a moment in midair in its withering steam. Yes, you cling, because I, like you, only sooner than you, will go down the path of vanished alphabets, the roadlessness to the other side of the darkness, your arms like the shoes left behind, like the adjectives in the halting speech of old men, which once could call up the forgotten nouns. And you yourself, some impossible Tuesday in the year 2009, will walk out among the black stones of the field in the rain, and the stones saying over their one word, CG, 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 and the raindrops hitting you on the fontanelle over and over, and you standing there, unable to let them in. If one day it happens, you find yourself with someone you love in a cafe at one end of Pont Mirabeau, at the zinc bar, where wine finds its shape in upward opening glasses, and if you commit then, as we did, the error of thinking, one day, this will only be memory. Learn to reach deeper under the sorrows to come, to touch the almost imaginary bones under the face, to hear under the laughter the wind crying across the black stones. Kiss the mouth that tells you here. Here is the world. This mouth, this laughter, these temple bones, the still undanced cadence of vanishing. In the light the moon sends back, I can see in your eyes the hand that waved once in my father's eyes, a tiny kite wobbling far up in the twilight of his last look. And the angel of all mortal things lets go the string. Back you go into your crib. The last blackbird lights up his gold wings. Farewell. Your eyes close inside your head in sleep. Already in your dreams, the hours begin to sing. Little sleep's head sprouting hair in the moonlight. When I come back, we will go out together. We will walk out together among the 10,000 things, each scratched in time with such knowledge. The wages of dying is love.
blessed have we been? How blessed do we continue to be? The genius and the friendship and the humor, the kindness. I've been remembering things. I've been thinking of, we've had events here before, many events when Galway was here in this wonderful underground Caracalla kind of Roman space. And I think of NYU. And I think of how sweet my gratitude is to have been working in that program with Galway and Yousef, to have such brothers at my side. How amazing. And in Squaw Valley, community with Bob and with Galway. And I remembered the day 30 years ago when Galway and I bought our twin fax machines <laughs> and our kind of matching uh, softball gloves. And then for, uh, I don't know, 20 years, those machines were puttering, often every day, puttering, puttering, sending a poem this way, and it, then sending it back with the marks all over it. Mm. So I want to read uh, first Galway's poem, Shelley. All the music, all the music we've been hearing. This is more of the moral music of, of Galway's voice. Not that there's any contrast between the two. Shelley, when I was 20, the one true free spirit I had heard of was Shelley. Shelley, who wrote tracts advocating atheism, free love, the emancipation of women, the abolition of wealth and class, and poems on the bliss of romantic love. Shelley, who I learned later, perhaps almost too late, remarried Harriet, then pregnant with their second child, and a few months later ran off with Mary, already pregnant herself, bringing with them Mary's stepsister, Claire, who very likely also became his lover. And in this malaise a trois, which Shelley had imagined would be a paradise of exiles, they lived, along with the specter of Harriet, who drowned herself in the serpentine, and of Mary's half-sister Fanny, who killed herself maybe for unrequited love of Shelley, and with the spirits of adored but often neglected children conceived incidentally in the pursuit of Eros, Harriet's, Ianthe, and Charles denied to Shelley and consigned to foster parents. Mary's Clara, dead at one. Her Wilmouse, Shelley's favorite, dead at three. Elena, the baby in Naples, almost surely Shelley's own, whom he adopted and then left behind, dead at one and a half. Allegra, Claire's daughter by Byron, whom Byron sent off to the convent at Banya Cavallo at four, dead at five. And in those days, before I knew any of this, I thought I followed Shelley, who thought he was following radiant desire. <laughs> oh. 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 Mm. Mm. And there's some way I realize that this should be, and if I have, if it, mm, whatever, read in Washington, should have been read in Washington during all those years that in, in 
when we're talking about morality of people, morality of nations, morality of grown-ups taking care of children. What a teacher, what a companion, what an inspiration. Now, some of you may have heard me tell this story before about walking beside a river and seeing bob up to me on the water a bottle. This bottle. And taking this bottle out of the water and taking out of the bottle this <laughs> message to Galway Canal. Message to Galway Canal. Tonight, all over the world, by singing light, you are being read. In a bazaar at Fez, someone is reading what a kingdom it was. And a rookie in his bat bag on the road with the socks carries two flower herding on Mount Monadnox. Near hibiscus on his royal lava crags, a Kamehamehan holds his body rags to his breast. And on the sea somewheres, a sailor weeps into her book of nightmares. And inked and dog-eared in Peru is a kissed copy of the avenue bearing the initial of Christ into the new world. And packed when the scrolls of the tents are furled and carried on their tongues by sephards and curds are mortal acts, mortal words. And up in the sky, an idolaclast astronaut is reading the past and missing the earth. Dear Grindle Stone, one misses when one has lived a long time alone. And in some pavillon of hardy silk, a Gaul in bonne foi is reading Rilk. Uh. <laughs> All your readers in the universe who have for your work no imperfect thirst, your readers, if I may be so bold as to say, on our hearts strong is your hold. On the tree of time below you and above you, they asked me to tell you tonight that they love you. With this, we all lift a glass as well and not so formal as Galway Canal. We thank you from our hearts where you live always to each of us our own one Galway. Certainly, it's hard to be eating oatmeal without Galway because we have his poem, Oatmeal. And I want to uh, read it first and then say some things because it was through Galway's poems that I came to know him years before when I read the bear um, I, uh, I'm sorry we don't have it tonight because, um, um, because Charlie Williams couldn't come. But you can go home and read it. And uh, then you'll, you'll understand Galway through his totem, the bear. But when you eat oatmeal, I eat oatmeal for breakfast. I make it on the hot plate and put skimmed milk on it. I eat it alone. 
I am aware it is not good to eat oatmeal alone. Its consistency is such that it is better for your mental health if somebody eats it with you. <laughs> that is why I often think up an imaginary companion to have breakfast with. Possibly it is even worse to eat oatmeal with an imaginary companion. <laughs> Nevertheless, yesterday I ate my oatmeal, porridge as he called it, with John Keats. <laughs> Keats and I, Keats said I was absolutely right to invite him. <laughs> Due to its glutinous, texture, gluey, absolutely lumpishness, hint of slime, and unusual willingness to disintegrate. Oatmeal should not be eaten alone. He said that in his opinion, however, it's perfectly okay to eat oatmeal with an imaginary companion. And that he himself had enjoyed memorable porridges with Edmund Spencer and John Milton. <laughs> Even if eating oatmeal with an imaginary companion is not as wholesome as Keats claims, still you can learn something from it. Yesterday morning, for instance, Keats told me about writing the Ode to a Nightingale. He had a heck of a time finishing it. Those were his words. I had a heck of a time, he said, more or less speaking through his porridge. He wrote it quickly on scripts of paper, which he then stuck in his pocket. But when he got home, he couldn't figure out the order of the stanzas. And he and a friend spread the papers on the table. They made some sense of them but he isn't sure to this day if they got it right. <laughs> An entire stanza may have slipped into the lining of his jacket through a hole in the pocket. He still wonders about the occasional sense of drift between stanzas and the way here and there a line will go into the configuration of a Muslim at prayer, then raise itself up and peer about, then lay itself down slightly off the mark, causing the poem to move forward with a reckless, shining wobble. He said someone told him later in life, Wordsworth heard about the scraps of paper on the table and tried shuffling some stanzas of his own, but it only made matters worse. I would not have known about any of this but for my reluctance to eat oatmeal alone. When breakfast was over, John recited to Autumn. He recited it slowly, with much feeling, and he articulated the words lovingly, and his odd accent sounded sweet. He didn't offer the story of writing to Autumn. I doubt if there is much of one, but he did say, the sight of a just-harvested oat field got him started on it. And two of the lines, for summer has or brim their clammy cells, and thou watchest the last oozings hour by hour, came to him while eating oatmeal alone. <laughs> I can see him drawing a spoon through the stuff, gazing into the glimmering furrows, murmuring. Maybe there is no sublime, only the shining of the amnion's tatters. For supper tonight, I am going to have a baked potato left over from lunch. I am aware that a leftover baked potato is damp, slippery, and simultaneously gummy and crumbly. And therefore, I'm going to invite Patrick Kavanaugh to join me. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, I must tell you that the poem has a lot to do with the way Gal Galway taught his writing classes. I was a student among the first students uh, in the 1980s when he started the program at NYU. And first class, he said, now we've worked together, what you must do is go down the street to Eddie's. It's on this block, gave us directions, it's on this block, go there, sit at table, order food and wine, and con continue the conversation. And we did. I mean, we took instruction. He was the teacher. We did. We did that. Every week we did that. And some of the people in that class are part, still part of my life, because what he taught me was not only how to craft poems, but how to make a family of poets. And look at us, <laughs> look at us. It is how to make a life as well as how to make a poem. And when the end of a semester came, Galway wouldn't let us leave for the summer without sitting down to eat together. That's how I met uh, Troy. And one year, and this is the, the last anecdote about this um, gift of his, he was to uh, read at the Ladies' Garment Workers Union Camp in the Poconos. And he said yes, he would do that if they would house his class. And so at the end of May, we all went to Pennsylvania, worked on poems, had dinner together, and then heard Galway read. And that, that gift of not leaving each other without, without sitting down at table, without working on our poems together, often without his fettuccine, um, will enable me to see Galway every time I see fettuccine on a menu and certainly every time I eat oatmeal. <laughs> I'm the last, but not the least. <laughs> Please speak directly into Mick, it says here. <laughs> I've never spoken directly into a Mick. <laughs> I want to remember Galway, most of all, as a dear personal friend I loved him very much. But I also want to remember, I want us to remember some of the things he did and stood for. He was a generous and loving friend and a supporter of so many people. I think the first time I became aware of him was on the cover of Life magazine in the 50s, a young poet uh, registering voters in the Deep South with a bloody bandage on his head. He was a great teacher, and I was a colleague of his at the Y, and at Sarah Lawrence, and at NYU. He was an organizer of events, a great master of ceremonies. Um, he led the bridge walk for many years. The one thing, and, and he tended to or nursed, as Whitman did, his dear friend James Wright, his last few weeks, and he was 
Etheridge Knight's teacher when Etheridge was in jail. And I think the most tender poem that Etheridge wrote is called Dear Galway. I like to remember in particular um, a celebration we had in a church. I can't remember the, which church it was. Um, that we read uh, Jubilato Año, Jubilate Año, and so many, so many of us fought over the poem we wanted to read, you know, uh, Jeffrey, our cat Jeffrey. I think James Wright read it that day. And um, Phil Levine was there, James Wright, of course, Etheridge, Muir Rookheiser was there, and later he wrote a beautiful, well, it was a, rec a reminiscence of that event and an extraordinary poem. Um, and I, I also want to remember what was, I think, the last poem he wrote. There were two poems. I can't remember the name of one of them. The other was called Gravity. And um, I believe it was the very last poem he wrote. I've chosen to read um, from uh, the avenue bearing the initial of Christ into the new world, the last section, which of course is, you can hear the voice of Walt Whitman, of course, always, but in particular in this section, you can hear the voice of Hart Crane. This ends that poem, and this ends, I guess, this event. Behind the power station on 14th, the held breath of, breath of light, as God is a held breath, withheld, spreads the East River, into which fishes leak, the brown sink or dissolve, the white float out in shoals and armadas. Even the gulls pass them by, pale, bloated socks of river water and rotted seed that swirl on the tide, punch back to the hellgate narrows, and on the ebb steam seaward, seeding the sea. On the avenue through the air tinted crimson, by neon over the bars, the rain is falling. You stood once on Houston among panhandlers and winos who weave the eastern ranges learning to be free, to not care, to be knocked flat, and to get up clear-headed, spitting the curses out. Now be nice, the proprietor threatens. Be nice, he cajoles. Fuck you, the bum shouts as he is hoisted again. God fuck your mother. In the empty doorway, hunched on the empty crate, the crone gives no sign. That night, a wildcat cab whined cross town on 7th. You knew even the traffic lights were made by God. The red splashes growing dimmer the farther away you looked. And away up at 14th, a few green stars, and without sequence, and nearly all at once, the red lights blinked into green. And just before there was one complete avenue of green, the little green stars in the distance blinked. It is night and raining. You look down toward Houston in the rain, the living streets, where instants of transcendence drift in oceans of loathing and fear, like lantern fishes or phosphorus flashings in the sea, or the feverish light skin is said to give off when the swimmer drowns at night. From the blind gut pit to the East River of fishes, the avenue cobbles a swath through the discolored air a roadway of refuse from the teeming shores and ghettos and the Caribbean paradise into the new ghetto 
a new paradise. This God-forsaken avenue bearing the initial of Christ through the haste and carelessness of the ages. The sea standing in heaps which keeps on collapsing where the drowned suffer a sea change and remain the common poor. Since providence for the realization of some unknown purpose has seen fit to leave this dangerous people on the face of the earth and did not destroy it. Listen, the swish of the blood, the sirens down the blood paths of the night, bone tapping on the bone, nerve nets singing under the breath of sleep. We scattered over the lonely seaways, over the lonely deserts did we run. In dark lanes and alleys, we did hide ourselves. The heart beats without windows in its night. The lungs put out the light of the world as they heave and collapse. The brain turns and rattles in its own black axle grease. In the nighttime of the blood, they're laughing and saying, our little lane, what a kingdom it was. Oy vey, oy vey. <laughs> Thank you for those beautiful readings and those beautiful stories. Thanks to all of you for listening. Galway's books are for sale in the lobby, so you can bring the poems home with you. Have a wonderful evening.